Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. We're going to continue our series today, talking about the Passion. We'll start with the Way of the Cross, and then move into the Crucifixion. When, after crowning with thorns, Jesus was once more brought before the people and Pilate, Pilate exclaimed, Ece homo, behold the man. At that point, Mary fell on her knees and worshipped her Lord, her God, while his enemies shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Jesus then was led into the middle of the court, and the slaves threw down the cross at his feet. He knelt down by its side, and circled it with his sacred arms, and kissed it three times, addressing at the same time a most touching prayer of thanksgiving to his heavenly Father for the work of redemption which had been entrusted to him. Jesus, when he embraced the cross, embraced the altar on which the bloody sacrifice was about to be offered. Jesus was both priest and victim. Priest because he made the offering, he did it willingly, Victim because he was the one to be sacrificed, the one to suffer and die. So the cross was a throne for the king of kings. It was the altar for Jesus to die upon. And the cross was also a pulpit because Jesus, as priest, from the pulpit of his cross, gave us the seven last words. The executioner placed the cross on his shoulder, then pulled him up roughly because he was totally unable to rise without assistance, and then he felt upon his shoulders the weight of that wood, that heavy wood, the weight of all of our sins. Then began the march, the march of the King of Kings. The sight of Jesus trembling under his burden strongly resembled Isaac when he carried the wood destined for his own sacrifice, carried it up the mountain. Jesus' feet were bare, swollen, and bleeding. His back was bent as though he were about to sink under the heavy weight of the cross, and his whole body was covered with wounds and blood. He appeared to be half fainting from exhaustion, weak from the loss of blood, and thoroughly parched with thirst that was produced by dehydration, fever, and pain. Four men held the cords which were fastened to his waist. They walked at some distance from him. The two in front pulled him on, and the two behind dragged him back, so that it was very difficult for him to move in any direction. His hands were cut by the cords for which they had been bound, his face bloody and disfigured, his hair and beard saturated with clotted blood. The weight of the cross and of his chains combined to press upon and make the woolen robe cleave to his wounds and reopen them. Derisive and heartless words were addressed to him, but he continued to pray pray for his persecutors, and his face bore an expression of combined 
love, and resignation. When those who were carrying the instruments for the execution were approaching, and the mother of Jesus saw their insolent and triumphant looks, she could not control her emotions. She joined her hands as if to implore the help of heaven, whereupon one among them said to his companions, What woman is that who is uttering such lamentations? The other answered, She's the mother of the Galilean. When the cruel men heard this, far from being moved to compassion, they began to make fun of the grief of this most afflicted mother. They pointed at her, and one of them took the nails which were to be used for fastening Jesus to the cross, and showed them to her in a most insulting and taunting manner. Then came her beloved son. He was almost sinking under the heavy weight of the cross, and his head, still crowned with thorns, was drooping in agony on his shoulder. He cast a look of compassion and sorrow upon his mother, staggered and fell upon his hands and knees for the second time. Mary was thoroughly agonized at the sight. Springing from her spot into the midst of the group who were insulting and abusing him, she threw herself on her knees by his side and embraced him. The only words to be heard were, Son, Mother. Jesus stumbled against a large stone, and the cross slipped from his shoulder. He fell upon the stone and was totally unable to rise. The crowd howled with joy at each fall. He now walks all bent over, and this hampers his steps. He stumbles again and falls on both knees, hurting himself where he was already wounded. One can clearly see on his shoulder the wound made by the rubbing of the cross. The rubbing of the cross itself has opened the many sores of the scourges, making them all into one from which serum and blood came forth, so that his white tunic is stained. Make sure that he dies only on the cross, shouted the crowd. This fall caused a new delay to Calvary, as he could not stand up again. The Pharisees shouted to the soldiers, We shall never get him to the place of execution alive if you do not find someone to carry his cross. At that moment Simon of Cyrene, a pagan, happened to pass by, accompanied by his three children. The soldiers, perceiving that he was a pagan, seized him and ordered him to assist Jesus in carrying the cross. A little interesting side note here, my friends. Simon of Cyrene was complaining and moaning that he didn't want to help carry the cross. By the time they reached Calvary, it was an entirely different story. Simon later converted to Catholicism, to Christianity, if you will, as did his two sons. And his two sons later died as martyrs, martyrs for Christ. Seven falls later, it was about a quarter to twelve when Jesus, laden with the cross, was dragged into the place of execution and thrown on the ground. Then Simon was driven off. What an awful spectacle it was for his mother. The place of execution, the hill of crucifixion, the terrible cross outstretched before her, the hammers, the ropes, the dreadful nails, and all around the brutal and drunken executioners with curses completing their preparations. Jesus implored the Father for strength and offered himself once more for the sins of his enemies. They dragged him with pushes, blows, and insults over these last few steps of his passion. The executioners pulled off Jesus' cloak, the belt to which the ropes were fastened, and his own belt. When they found that on account of the crown of thorns it was impossible to drag the woolen garment over his head, which his mother had woven for him, they tore off the crown, thus reopening every wound, 
and crudely seizing the garment, tore it mercilessly over his bleeding and wounded head. He shook like a leaf as he stood before them, for he was so anemic and weakened from suffering, from the loss of blood, that he couldn't support himself for more than a few minutes. He was covered with open wounds, and his shoulders and back were torn to the bone by the dreadful scourging. Then they took the crown of thorns and put it back onto his head and beat it in so that it would stay in place. There were eighteen executioners, the six scourgers, the four that led Jesus, the two that held the ropes, and six crucifiers. They were short, powerfully built men, filthy in appearance, cruel and beastly looking, and their features denoted foreign origin. Their hair was bushy and their beard scrubby. There stood the Son of Man, trembling in every limb, covered with blood and welts, with wounds, some clotting, some bleeding, covered with scars and bruises. He still retained a short woolen scapular over his breast and back and a tunic around his loins. The wool of the scapular had stuck onto his wounds, cemented by the blood from the deep wound made by the heavy cross on his shoulder. This last wound caused Jesus the most unspeakable suffering. The scapular was now torn ruthlessly from his lacerated and swollen body. Jesus was now stretched out before the executioners. He had laid himself upon the cross. Crudely they drew his right hand to the hole for the nail in the right arm of the cross piece of the cross, and they tied his wrist fast with a rope. One knelt on his sacred breast and held the hand flat. Another placed a thick nail that had been filed to a sharp point upon the palm of his hand and struck it with furious blows from the iron hammer. A cry of anguish from the Lord's lips, and his blood spurted out on the arms of the executioners. The muscles and ligaments of the hand had been torn by the three-edged nail driven into the narrow hole. The Blessed Virgin kept lamenting in a weakened voice. The nails, at the sight of which Jesus shuddered, were so long that when the executioners grasped them in their fists, they projected about an inch at either end. When hammered in, the points could be just seen projecting a little on the opposite side of the wood of the cross. After nailing the right hand, the crucifiers found that his left, which had also been tied to the cross piece, did not reach the hole made for the nail, because they had bored it a good two inches away from the fingertips. Consequently, they untied Jesus' left arm from the cross, wound cords around it, and with their feet supported firmly against the cross, pulled it forward crudely until the hand reached the hole. Then kneeling on the arm and breast of the Lord, they fastened the arm again on the beam and hammered the second nail through the left hand. The blood spurted out, and Jesus' cry of agony sounded above the noise of the strokes of the hammer. Both arms had been torn and stretched out of their sockets. His shoulders became hollow, and at the elbows one could see the disjointed bones. Jesus heaved heavily, and his, he his legs were drawn up. His arms were stretched in so straight a line that they no longer covered the oblique rising cross pieces, and one could see through the spaces made between his armpits. The Blessed Virgin endured all this horrific torture with Jesus. She became as pale as a corpse, and low moans of agony sounded from her lips. Meanwhile, the Pharisees were mocking and jesting near where she was standing. Therefore John took her to the other holy women who stood at a distance from the place. The whole body of Jesus had been in spasm by the violent stretching of his arms to the holes for the nails. 
his knees being consequently and inevitably drawn up from the pain. The executioners now fell furiously upon them, and winding ropes around them, fastened them down to the cross. But on account of the mistake made in the placing of the hails in the cross piece, the sacred feet of Jesus did not reach the block that had been made for them. When the executioners saw this, they again uttered more curses and insults with horrible scoffing. They cried out, He will not stretch himself out, but we will help him. They then tied ropes around his legs, and with horrible violence and terrible torture to Jesus, pulled the feet down to the block and tied the leg fast with cords. Jesus' body was thus most horribly stretched. His limbs had been so violently distended, and his muscles and skin so pitifully stretched, that the ribs of his chest could now be counted one by one. The whole body was covered with wounds, swellings, scars, bruises, and boils, blue, brown, and yellow, and bloody patches from which the skin had been peeled. His chest gave way with a crackling sound, and he moaned aloud, Oh God! Oh God! His abdomen was totally stretched out, and it was as if the ribs broke away from the breastbone. His suffering was too horrible, too horrible for words. With similar violence, the left foot was then drawn and fastened tightly with cords over the right, and because it did not rest on the block firmly enough over the right one, the instep was bored with a flat, fine piercer, much finer than the one used for the hands. Then seizing the most frightful-looking nail of all, which was much longer than the others, they drove it with great force through the wounded instep of the left foot and that of the right foot resting below. With a loud metallic sound, it passed through Jesus' feet into the hole prepared for it in the foot block, one nail passing through both feet. The nailing of the feet was the most horrid of all on account of the distension of the whole body. Thirty-six strokes of the hammer amidst moans so mournful, so anguishing. At the sound of the tearing and moaning that accompanied the nailing of the feet, in her most holy compassion, the Blessed Virgin became like one with her son. And the holy women, supporting her by the arms, led her again from the circle just as the jeering Pharisees were drawing near. Mingled with his moans were uninterrupted prayers, passages from the Psalms and prophecies, which predictions he was now fulfilling. During the whole time, the whole time of his bitter passion, and until the moment of death, he was engaged in these kinds of prayers and the uninterrupted fulfillment of the prophecies. By means of ropes, several of the executioners now lifted the cross upright, while others supported it with blocks around the end of the trunk. They raised the top of the cross forward until it was perpendicular to the ground, and its whole weight was suddenly dropped with a tremendous thud down into the hole. The cross vibrated for a long time under the shock, and Jesus cried out aloud. His outstretched body fell lower. The wounds were opened wider. His blood ran more profusely, and the dislocated bones struck against one another. The executioners now shook the cross again in their effort to steady it, and hammered five more wedges into the hole around it. When the upright cross finally fell with a loud crash into the hole prepared for it, an eerie moment of deep silence followed. It seemed as if a new emotion of horror, one never before experienced, fell upon every heart on beholding the cross, swaying in the air, and eventually plunging into its place with a heavy crash, 
amidst the jeering shouts of the executioners, the Pharisees, and the distant crowd, which Jesus was now able to see from his vantage point. While Jesus was thus standing upright upon the cross, and the cries of derision had for a few minutes been reduced to sudden silence, the flourish of trumpets sounded from the temple. It announced that the slaughter of the paschal lambs had begun for the feast, the Passover, that they were about to celebrate. But on the cross the words of John the Baptist were being fulfilled. Behold the Lamb of God who has taken upon himself the sins of the world. It lasted for hours, the pain and suffering, the jeering, mockery. All this time the mother of Jesus, Mary Clopas, Mary Magdalene and John were standing around the cross, looking up helplessly at the Lord. The Blessed Virgin, overcome by maternal love, was in her heart fervently imploring Jesus to allow her to die with him. At that moment, Jesus cast an earnest and compassionate glance down upon his mother, and turning his eyes toward her, he said, Woman, behold your son. He then turned to John and said, Behold your mother. Towards the third hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When the most afflicted mother heard the voice of her son, she could no longer restrain herself. She again pressed forward to the cross, followed by John, Mary Clopas, Magdalene, and Salome. The body of Jesus could be seen on the cross, pale, weak, perfectly exhausted, becoming more and more white from the great loss of blood. The hour of the Lord had now come. He was struggling with a death, and a cold sweat burst out in every limb. Jesus spoke, It is consummated. And raising his head, he cried with surprisingly a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Then he bowed his head and died. His lips blew and parted disclosed the dry and bloody tongue in his open mouth. His fingers, which had been contracted round the heads of the nails, now relaxed and fell a little forward. His back straightened itself against the cross, and the whole weight of his sacred body fell upon the feet. His knees were bent and fell to one side, and his feet twisted around the nail that pierced them. It was just after three o'clock when Jesus expired. His mother's eyes grew dim. The paleness of death overspread her countenance. Her feet tottered, and she sank to the earth. When she arose from the ground, she beheld the body of her son, whom she had conceived, flesh of her flesh, bone of her bones, the heart of her heart, now deprived of all its beauty, and even of its most holy soul, given up to the laws of that nature which he himself had created and by which man had, by sin, abused and defigured. She held her beloved son, crushed, maltreated, disfigured, and put to death by the hands of those whom he had come in the flesh to restore and redeem. Put to death by you and I, brothers and sisters, by our sins. As the executioner still appeared to have some doubts as to the death of the Lord, Cassius, a junior officer, afterwards known as Longinus, suddenly drove his lance upward with such violence into the hollow right side of the body of Jesus, through the entrails and into the heart, that its point also opened a little wound in the left chest. When he withdrew the lance, a stream of blood and water gushed forth and flowed over his upraised face. He sprang quickly from his horse, fell on his knees, struck his breast, and before all, proclaimed aloud his belief in Jesus, 
who was indeed already dead, and so there was no need to break his legs. Prophecy was fulfilled. Not a bone was broken. The Blessed Virgin John and the Holy Women, whose eyes were riveted upon Jesus, accompanied the thrust of the lance with a cry of woe, and rushed up to the cross. For Mary it was as if the thrust had pierced her own heart. She sank into the arms of her friends, while Cassius, still on his knees, truly confessed the Lord, and joyfully praised God. Truly, this was the Son of God. When Jesus said from the cross, Woman, behold your son. If he had called her mother, she would have been just his mother, and no one else's. In order to indicate that she is now becoming the mother of all men, whom he redeems, he endows her with the title of universal motherhood woman. Then, indicating with a gesture of his head the presence of the beloved disciple, he added, Behold thy son. He does not call him John, for if he did, John would have been only the son of Zebedee. He left him unnamed, so that he might stand for all humanity. It was kind of a testament at the Last Supper he willed to mankind his body and his blood. This is my body. This is the chalice of my blood. Now he was willing us the last thing that he possessed on earth, his mother. He said to John, Behold thy mother. Our blessed Lord was here establishing a new relationship a relationship by which his own mother became the mother of all mankind, and we in turn became her children. This new bond was not carnal, but spiritual. There are other ties than those of blood. Blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. All men, whatever their color, race, blood, are one in spirit. Mary had seen God in Christ. Now her son was telling her to see her Christ in all Christians. She was never to love anyone else but him. But now he would be in those whom he redeemed. The night before he had prayed that all men might be one in him, as there is but one life for the vine and its branches. Now he was making her the custodian, not only of the vine, but also of the branches. And we are the branches. And Mary is our custodian through time and eternity. She had given birth to the king. Now she was begetting the kingdom. Christ was the head of a redeemed humanity. At Bethlehem, Mary was the mother of Christ. On Calvary, she became the mother of Christians. In the stable, she brought forth her son without pain and became the mother of joy. At the cross, she brought us forth in pain and became the queen of martyrs. In neither case shall a woman forget the child of her womb. If you have never prayed before to Mary, do so now. Can you not see that if Christ himself willed to be physically formed in her for nine months and then be spiritually formed by her for thirty years, it is to her that we must go to learn how to have Christ formed in us. Only she who raised Christ can raise a Christian. Well, we're out of time, ladies and gentlemen. We hope that you'll join us again next week. Please keep us in your prayers, and remember that we want to be with you. Take care now, and God bless.